If you've got nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Do you remember that? That mantra from the early 2000s, post 9-11, of course, when the entire world changed. We in the United States learned that the world is a dangerous place, full of enemies who we have to be constantly vigilant, constantly on guard to defend against. And we were told that the sacrifice of our privacy, of our basic civil liberties, the sorts of things which fundamentally made this nation great to begin with, well, that we had to sacrifice some of them in order to stay safe. Do you remember the words, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear? Well, it's a great thing now. Because the fact is, is that you need not fear at all. Because you can't hide at all. In much the same way that we have been told for ages that big government was coming for us, that Big Brother was watching us, that dystopia would come in the form of jack-booted men in gas masks and body armor, repelling in through our windows with submachine guns, pressing them to the heads of our children, saying to turn over everything that we had, or that we were sus suspected of subversion, and that we had been watched. That that's how dystopia would come up on us? Well, just in the same way that this series of mine is not called Warning Dystopia Coming, but Dystopia Now. Well, we've fallen right into that trap, but thankfully it hasn't been the government that brought it to us. No, it's been our venerated private industry. That's right. Big tech, as we're so often told to fear. And we should fear it. And we should have feared it a good long time ago. But much like the way in which the creeping menace of modern dystopia genuinely takes us over, it wasn't a jackbooted thug kicking down our door, repelling in through our window, and putting a gun to our head telling us we had to take it. No, it was that age-old American promise of commercial convenience giving us a better tomorrow through technology. Consider this. Yes. When you leave the house, what is your checklist? I would imagine it's probably your wallet and or pocketbook, um, your keys, and of course your phone, which themselves are all increasingly coming to be one and the same. In much the same way, we had conspiracy nut jobs like Alex Jones saying that the government's coming through to microchip us. Well, nowadays we're microchipping ourselves because we can open up and activate our cars that way. We can activate and disarm our own home security systems by simple virtue of our microchip implants, but that's still a ways off. But then we also forget Google Glass, don't we? We forget the fact that that genuinely obnoxious bit of headwear with its curious little eye monitor and the fact that it looked like a pair of safety goggles was not something that you would, if you were an average person outside of some Silicon Valley goon, want to wear in public. But oh, worry not, the market has a solution. Now we have watches, Apple watches, Samsung watches, even Amazon is starting to come out with wearable tech. And to get back to the phone, what is it that your modern phone actually is? If you were to discuss or explain to a, well, let's say, 10-year-old what the nature of a phone was as you in your perhaps 30s was growing up, the fact that it was either a device that was hooked onto the wall and plugged into a series of cables which ran out of your house and along a series of power lines. And that the function of it was that somebody could dial a number and if they couldn't reach you, new technology allowed them to record their voice on a bit of cassette tape and you could play it back and call them. If you were to explain that even after that, the advent of cell phones, which themselves were initially seen as gaudy sort of superfluous devices owned by the ultra-wealthy who believed that their time was so precious that they couldn't afford to miss a phone call, and then you were to compare it to today, 
they tend to look at you as though you're speaking Greek. Why is that? Because the phones of today aren't phones at all. They're small computers. What do they have on them? Why, of course, high-definition cameras, highly sensitive microphones, GPS tracking devices, all which you're encouraged to keep on at all times for your convenience. I myself have just recently discovered a rather disturbing trend when it comes to mobile technology. Now my phone, being as well, honestly broke and generally poor as I am, is itself a four-year-old LG phone, something I've kept alive for quite a while. Now I've taken to turning off every available service, that being location or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or any of it, simply to save battery life, as I get about, oh, I'd say, 25 minutes of useful life out of that phone on a daily basis as it stands. But when I noticed that when I l turned location off, it wasn't the phone's program which told me I should turn it back on, but rather Google. Google, on about an average of, I'd say, almost 20 minutes a day, is very keen to tell me that I should turn location services on to improve my experience, to improve my overall convenience. In this same way, though, even stepping back from the smartphone, which tracks every single motion you make, tracks everywhere you go, tracks everything you do, and then connects that to your digital profile built from the mix of Facebook and Google and endless other apps and social media conveniences which you have voluntarily participated in and given your data and name and likeness and overall personality too in the interest of crafting a better experience for you. Even before any of this was a thing, Let's consider some other elements and aspects which greatly benefit the big machinery which ultimately governs the course of your life by virtue of selling it to you on a notion of convenience. How many of you have an easy pass? This, of course, being an RFID module connected to your car, which is connected to your credit or debit card, which is connected to your bank, which is connected to your identity, which is then connected to everything else they know about you. But in the course of this, your very emotions are tracked and understood. We know this because law enforcement has been successful in actually locating uh, suspects and fugitives by simple virtue of them making the mistake of taking their own vehicles out on the road and then passing through the easy pass toll systems which on some highways, depending on what state you're in, are ultimately the only ways by which you can pay tolls for those highways in the first place. But don't think of it as a way to track you. Think of it as a matter of convenience. In the same way that Amazon now wants to sell you what look increasingly like designer glasses frames. In the same way that Apple and Samsung can't wait for you to adopt their new watches. They'll not only monitor your heart rate, or even track your spending for you. Track your spending, track where you spend, track what you spend on. Track that and compare it to your overall health profile. Compare that to your job. Compare that to the overall averages for what it is your job expects of you physically. And then encourage you to get in just the perfect shape to make sure that you can do your job just perfectly. Are you seeing the pattern yet? We have all been sold the notion that Big Brother and dystopia would come in the form of a militant government which is kicking down our doors to make sure that we're complying and not reading anything nefarious or out of sorts. But given the fact that libraries are in such decline that even here in Manchester, they tend to be filled more with sleeping junkies looking to charge their smartphones and log into Facebook than they are people curious about the nature of literature that's contained therein, and that most of us tend to get our literature via the internet and Amazon. That in the same way that we shouldn't be surprised that a simple singular Google search for a random curiosity results weeks later in a series of ads pushing us towards that very same thing. That the nature of mass surveillance is not one which is pushed upon you. It's not one in which the Stasi is telling your neighbors to snitch you out. The notion of the big government boogeyman is sold by your conventional conspiracy theorists and, of course, your anti-government conservatives who believe that the free market is the best cure for all of our social ills. It's not a matter of force. 
It's a matter of convenience. It's a matter of clever marketing. Knowing from analyzing and considering your digital profile what it is you really want, and then finding a way to convince you that what they want you to have is what you really want. Consider at the same time, on the political side of things, how it is we view whistleblowers now. When it's discovered that those at the highest levels of power are doing nefarious things, we're often so encouraged to view them as traitors to the people. Now, though perhaps someone like Edward Snowden, for instance, may have been looking for some level of well, personal relevance in the course of his revealing of the NSA's mass surveillance systems, was the information that he gave us not ultimately worth it? And an even bigger question, are you even fully informed and aware of what that was? And even beyond that, how many people do you know regard him as a traitor to the people? All the while, this national security apparatus, with a long history of doing questionable things, is much like Facebook, much like Google, much like Amazon, much like any other powerful entity with a digital presence in your life, seeking to track, monitor, and overall understand your habits if not to sell you something, then to know when you might be a threat. Because God forbid you think the wrong way. God forbid you question whether or not it's worth continuing to buy shit. God forbid you ever start to question the nature of the system itself. God forbid any of that. But again, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, and you have no reason to fear, because you quite simply cannot hide. <laughs>